This original WSRE presentation is made possible by viewers like you. Thank you. One day the devil came to him, for he was a minor demon, asked him to torture some humans. With his two friends in tow, Middens and Hell Sappho, the Baron Mondo Van Duren, on Nightmare Theater. Well, sure, Mittens, the nerds got their revenge at the end of the movie, and you'd think that would have been the end of it, but it wasn't. There were three sequels, Nerds in Paradise, Next Generation, and Nerds in Love, Nerds are constantly under assault and must be forever vigilant. Oh, uh, I gotta go. Uh, greetings, my friends, and welcome once again to Nightmare Theater. I'm your host, the Baron Mondo Von Doren, and with me as always is Mittens the Werewolf. We were discussing the plight of nerds and their never-ending need for revenge. And we are, once again, waiting for my useless jerk of all work, El Sapo, to show up. I'm not sure where he could be, but he really ought to be here any second with a- Hey, boss. Hey, Mittens. How are you fellas doing today? We were doing good until you showed up. I'll go ahead and ask you the eternal question. Do you have a movie for tonight? Nope, I do not because choir practice ran late and I got sidetracked. But I do have this. What? Can you show this while I run down and look for one? I'll try to find something extra good. I have no confidence you will, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Let me see what he gave me. Oh boy, another chapter of The Phantom Creeps and a cartoon, eh, not much to get excited about. Okay, Mittens, let's give it a shot. Try to enjoy this, folks, and hopefully El Sapo will find a good movie to make it up to you. guy's license number? I sure did. 130,000 volts. That's what wrecked us when I pulled the red gadget on the box. Oh, that was a close one. Better see if the box is still there. And I'm going after that guy we picked up in Zorka's lab. And this is no time for a manhunt. It's more important we get that mystery box to the federal lab for an analysis. Blow up the whole city? I guess you're right. We'll take it to Dr. Mallory's house. We'll be safer there. We're not the only survivors. The box is still here.
that guy get away. He's one of the spy rings. The police will catch him. He can't get far with that bullet. Hey, what's going on here? You fellas trying to electrocute yourself? Who's driving that car? Take it easy. Okay, Captain West. We have to get to Dr. Mallory's right away. Special business. I'll give you a lift. All right, thanks. I'll tell you all about it on the way. of my vengeance. <laughs> so you decided to come back, did you? The federal men broke in. They carried me off. They stole the meteor. You're lying. I left you on guard and you betrayed me. You've sold the source of my power to my enemies. No, I swear it. And why did you remove that box from the secret vault? I heard voices. I thought strangers were coming to steal it. I shall show you what happens to those who cross me. No, don't let him get me. No. I'm wounded. I'm shot. I swear I'm not lying. Look! Tell me what happened. Come. Put up your sleeve. Put your arms to the tube in front of the ray. Take your arm out. You felt nothing. Not a thing. Painless surgery. This and a thousand greater powers are possible with the secret element. And now the source of it is gone. But they shall not keep it. No government shall possess my power. I know where Bob has to stake in my meteor. But I can't go with you. They know me now. If I'm taken, they'll throw me back into Alcatraz. You can make yourself invisible. The Phantom will continue to protect you. Thanks, officer. The newspaper nemesis. What's in the box? Lunch for Dr. Mallory. Maybe he'll swallow that, but not me. Listen, my editor's putting the pressure on me for a story. Is that one of the late Dr. Zorka's gadgets? Look, Miss Drew, the safety of this country depends on the contents of this box. There are spies in the city paid to see Zorka's secret. Here comes Brown now. The G-Men just carried a box into Mallory's house. Okay, I'll call the chief and tell him he's at the airport. You get back and watch the house. Why don't you, Sarpel, yearn for sensational headlines where we tell you differently? Oh, all right. 
On condition that I get the scoop when you're ready. Hello, Dr. Miller. Hello, Bob. Good, you found something. Something, it's dynamite. Oh, if you don't mind, Miss Drew, I would prefer that only Captain West and Lieutenant Daly come into the laboratory. Well, Miss Drew has made her peace with the government. Well, just the same, I'm afraid I'll have to exclude the press from this interview. Go on, young lady, take a walk. Two sets of prints on this box other than ours. Zorka probably handled it while he was alive, and the uh, others must have belonged to the fellow who got away. Jim, take these uh, down, will you? X-22-37. Wait. This is the source of Zorka's element. I'm certain of it. The neometer is reacting exactly as it did to the disc we found on Miss Drew. Wait here, Monk. I might be able to extract Zorka's element from this material if I had time enough and the right equipment. It took Madame Coré 14 years to isolate radium. Zorka's equipment's probably still in his lab. Why don't you work there? I'll tell you what, Mallory, I'll take you to Zorka's myself. Personal escort service. What's that? Well, either this place is haunted or I am. All right, Jim, you take Dr. Mallory to Zorka's. I'll follow along as soon as I talk to the office. Well, you better make your call from outside. His wires have been tapped. Come on, Doc. Right. Drive to the laboratory. Mallory is playing directly into my hands. I'll meet you at Zarkas. The federal boy just left for Zorka's house. They've got the box with them. They will head for our airport. The chief has a plane ready for it. Long distance? This is Captain West, DMI, calling the War Department in Washington, D.C. Reverse the charges. Very urgent. You know, I don't feel any too comfortable with that thing so close. Nothing can happen as long as the meteorite is not exposed. Car is still trailing us. Get off the road and out of sight when we round that curve ahead. All clear. <laughs> Wait a minute, there's somebody in the back. All right, come on, buddy, climb up. Oh, please, no. Wait a minute. Oh, you're a lot of help. Just a hitchhiker, Doctor. Can I go along with you? Be a good scout. Go on, bait it. Look, that car is coming back. Whoever's in that car knows we've got the meteorite. All right, get in. Stay down. Getting soft hearted, huh? Look at the wisecrack, and there's trouble coming. We don't want gunfire while we're carrying that box. Keep your hands where they are. Push the guy at the wheel. Who's in the back? All right, come on, get out, you. That's what we're after. Be careful. If you drop that, we'll be blown to bits. Don't take the lid off while I'm around, either. Put that in our car. Handle it carefully. All right, start driving. 
And don't forget we're behind you, so don't get funny. I can't. I've lost the keys. All right, wise guy. Pile out, all of you. We'll take you in our car. Come on, get moving. with my element and plant them along the doorstep. But the discs? When our friends Captain West and Dr. Mallory walk in, no disc will be necessary. The meteorite they are carrying contains enough magnetism to attract thousands of spiders. They should be here. Something has gone wrong. They should be here by now. Would you care if they had an accident? Idiot. With those fools handling it, the meteorite is liable to explode and I shall lose it. I shall wait no longer. This Nyamata will lead me to my meteorite. Come.
Yet another episode of The Phantom Creeps is in the books. We'll continue the show here in just a minute. Until then, I'd like to thank all of you for the emails we've received at nightmaretheater.com, especially the ones not threatening legal action. Please feel free to contact us as many times as you want. El Sapo really needs something to fill those quiet, lonely hours in between episodes. So email us today or visit us at nightmaretheater.com. We'll be waiting.
mummy, the 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 mummy. and welcome back to Nightmare Theater. That was a great cartoon, wasn't it? The Magic Mummy. And what about chapter four of The Phantom Creeps? Looks like it could be the final chapter, doesn't it? That plane crashed, those poor souls are gone. Now Mittens, let's take a moment to remember and reflect on that lady and that man. Oh, whatever their names were. Farewell to both of those characters. Mittens and I are still here waiting for El Sapo to return with tonight's movie. No telling where he is or what he is doing. Hey boss, sorry it took me so long, but I think I found a good movie for you tonight. You are going to love what I am about to give you. Tell me it's your resignation letter. No, no, it's even better. It's a film by perhaps the greatest movie maker of all time. You got us an Alfred Hitchcock movie? Oh, that guy was a hack compared to this guy. Check it out, boss. Let me see what you got there. Ooh, The House on Haunted Hill. Wait, is this the remake or, no, this is the original. The William Castle original starring Vincent Price and directed by the man himself, William Castle. Wow, for once you have done a good job, El Sapo. Well, thanks, boss. I know how much you like the William Castle. Oh, I do. He was really great. The best gimmick man ever. He offered life insurance in case anyone died of fright while watching one of his films. And during the film Mr. Sardonicus, he stopped the film and appeared on screen and asked the audience to vote for how the film should end. He created The Coward's Corner. That was a gimmick where if you were too scared, you had an opportunity to leave the theater and wait in the booth until the film ended. For 13 ghosts, he gave the audience viewers with red and blue lenses. If you wanted to see the ghost, you'd look through the red lens. If you were a coward, like El Sapo, you look through the blue lens. And The Tingler. Good gravy. The Tingler. Very good stuff. What about this film? What gimmick does he use in this film? Well, we'll talk about that when it happens, but as a preview, it was called Emergo. But back to the tingler. Castle actually put buzzers in some seats in the theater, and at a certain part of the film, the buzzers would go off, scaring the hell out of the audience. He was very innovative. So let's get right back to it. Sit back, relax, as Nightmare Theater presents, for once, a true classic, The House on Haunted Hill. Since it was built a century ago, seven people, including my brother, have been murdered in it. Since then, I've owned the house. I've only spent one night there, and when they found me in the morning, I, I was almost dead. I'm Frederick Lauren. And I've rented the house on Haunted Hill tonight so that my wife can give a party. A haunted house party. <laughs> She's so amusing. There'll be food and drink and ghosts. And perhaps even a few murders. You're all invited. If any of you will spend the next 12 hours in this house, I'll give you each $10,000. Or your next of kin in case you don't survive. Ah, but here come our other guests. It was my wife's idea to have our guests come in funeral cars. She's so amusing. Her sense of humor is, shall we say, original. I dreamed up the hearse. It's empty now, but after a night in the house on Haunted Hill, who knows? This is Lance Schroeder, a test pilot. So no doubt a brave man. 
But don't you think you can be much braver if you're paid for it? And I happen to know that Lance needs the 10,000 I'll give him, if he's brave enough to stay all night. This is Ruth Bridges. You've no doubt read her column in the newspapers. She says her reason for coming to the party is to write a feature article on ghosts. She's also desperate for money, gambles. You've already met Watson Pritchard, a man living in mortal fear of a house, and yet he is risking his life to spend another night here. I wonder why. He says for money. This is Dr. David Trent, a psychiatrist. He claims that my ghost will help his work on hysteria. But don't you see a little touch of greed there? around the mouth and eyes. This is Nora Manning. I picked her from the thousands of people who work for me because she needed the 10,000 more than most. Supports her whole family. Isn't she pretty? The party's starting now, and you have until midnight to find the house on Haunted Hill. Only the ghosts in this house are glad we're here. Are we all strangers to each other? Don't you two know each other? I'm afraid I don't even know your name. I'm Nora Manning. Lance Schroeder. Is Frederick Lauren a friend of yours? I've heard of him, but I've never met him. I work for one of his companies, but I've never seen him. I've never met the man either. Just a phone call. Do you know him? <laughs> no. Well, then you're the only one of us who does. I don't know him. All the details about running the house were done by mail. He's quite wealthy, isn't he? Millions. And uh, five wives, I believe. Four, I think, so far. A $50,000 party for only five people is a little steep, even for a millionaire. <laughs> well, if I were going to haunt anybody, this would certainly be the house I'd do it in. Who 
close the door. This thing's made of solid steel. Unfortunately, still alive. Is your face on yet? Dust and dirt everywhere, and the water barely trickles. Couldn't you have had the place cleaned? Atmosphere, darling. You know how ghosts are. They never tidy up. Well, that's a very fetching outfit, but hardly suitable for a party. I'm not going to the party. Mm, this spend the night ghost party was your idea, remember? Since it's going to cost me $50,000, I want you to have fun. The party was my idea until you invited all the guests. Why all these strangers? Why none of our friends? Friends? Do we have any friends? No, your jealousy took care of that. I had a reason for inviting each guest. I wanted kind of a cross-section. From psychiatrist to typist, and from drunk to jet pilot. They share one thing. They all need money. Now let's see if they're brave enough to earn it. And you call this a party? Could be. Why do you always do that? It spoils the champagne. It might explode. Never does. Would you guarantee that? That isn't funny, Frederick. Make a good headline. Playboy kills wife with champagne cork. Will you join me? No, thank you. Just a sip might improve your humor. My humor is fine, thanks. And I haven't poisoned it. It's always good to know that. Have some. You'll enjoy the party more. Go on. Your trust is so touching. And I'm not going to the party. Of all my wives, you're the least agreeable. But still alive. Hmm. Would you go away for a million dollars, tax-free? You want it all, don't you? I deserve it all. Your jealousy isn't tax-free, and your possessiveness is maddening. If ever a man had grounds for divorce. But can't prove them. The time will come. You'll slip up one of these days. Think so? If I live long enough. You remember the fun we had when you poisoned me? <laughs> Something you ate, the doctor said. Yes. Arsenic on the rocks. Annabelle. You'd do it again if you thought you could get away with it, wouldn't you? Darling, what makes you think that? Something about you. that hanging is very uncomfortable, in case you get any more ideas. Now don't let the ghosts and the ghouls disturb you, darling. Darling, the only ghoul in the house is you. And don't sit up all night thinking of ways to get rid of me. It makes wrinkles. she used on my brother and her sister. Hacked them to pieces. We found parts of the bodies all over the house, in places you wouldn't think. The funny thing is the heads have never been found. Hands and feet and things like that. But no heads. The wife, probably in a rage, threatened the husband with a knife and then, carried away by hysteria, took a swing at him and simply went on from there. Well, she certainly went on. How many people did she kill, Mr. Pritchard? Only two. Her husband and her sister. No one else was here. So there are two loose heads just floating around in here somewhere? You can hear them at night. They whisper to each other and then cry. 
<laughs> Since our host isn't here, would anyone care to mix me a drink? Certainly. What will you have? Good evening. I'm your host, Frederick Lauren. Since we're all strangers to each other, let's get acquainted with the drink, shall we? Mr. Lauren, I advise you to call this party off now. The ghosts are already moving, and that's a bad sign. Let me apologize for my wife. She'll join us later. What do you have? Scotch and. Doctor? I'll have the same. Now, before the party begins, let's go over the details. The caretakers will leave at midnight, locking us in here until they come back in the morning. Once the door is locked, there's no way out. The windows have bars that a jail would be proud of, and the only door to the outside locks like a vault. There's no electricity, no phone, no one within miles, so no way to call for help. Like a coffin. So, if any of you decide not to stay for the party, you must let me know before midnight. Of course, if you leave, I shan't be able to pay you anything. I'm interested in your reasons for this, uh, party. Aside from pleasant company. Ghosts, Doctor. I think everyone wonders what they would do if they saw a ghost. And now my wife has given us all the opportunity to find out. Hmm. Amusing. Ghosts, etc., being only creations of hysteria, your party should be a success. Well, Pritchard here promises us genuine ghosts. Seven now. Maybe more before morning. That's cheerful. Four men have been murdered in this house. And three women. You planned your party very well, Mr. Lauren. Four of us are men, three are women. A ghost for everybody. Hmm. Well, Pritchard, why don't you take us on a tour through the house and let's see what happens, huh? See that stain? Blood. A young girl was killed here. And whatever got her wasn't human. Don't stand there. What do you mean? Where? It's too late. They've marked you. Ridiculous. The roof probably leaks. Oh, that must be what it is. Who would want to haunt me? I would say any self-respecting male ghost. I hope it doesn't come back. Well, Mr. Pritchard, you're the life of the party. Oh, he hasn't even started yet. Wasn't there a man who threw his wife into a wine vat or something? That was in the cellar. There's been a murder almost every place in this house. Who didn't die here, he was electrocuted later. Mr. Norton did a good deal of experimenting with wines. But his wife didn't think it was any good. So he filled the vat with acid and threw her in. She was supposed to stay down. But the bones came up. It's a funny thing. But none of the murders here were just ordinary. Just shooting or stabbing. They've all been sort of wild, violent, and different. Look out! God, she didn't fall in. You mean there's still acid in there? everything with hair and flesh. Just leaves the bones. Hmm. 
My, it's dry and dusty down here. Well, there's a, a cure for that upstairs. <laughs> Come on. You get invited to this party. No. no. Go on. I mean, what did he tell you? Mr. Lawrence said everybody would get ten thousand dollars. But he didn't say anything about being locked in. No. Uh, he just made a deal with me on the phone, but nothing about having to stay. Aren't you going to stay? If I don't, I lose ten thousand dollars. I'm going to stay, too. Ten thousand dollars. Yeah. You believe in ghosts? I don't know. Well, I agree with what that doc says. You can spook yourself. I've done it in planes. Seen things that weren't really there. Or were they? <laughs> <laughs> what are you going to do with your ten thousand? If we get it. What do you mean, if we get it? Won't he pay us if we stay? Ah, sure he will. Ten thousand is no more to him than a nickel is to us. We were in an automobile accident. Now I'm the only one in the family who can make any money. Boy, I've never seen so many doors. Closet? Does it go anywhere? Money won't cure. I must have, must have bumped my head. And the only way you could bump your head in here is to run head on into the wall. You didn't do that, did you? Let's get a bandage on that. I wonder why they didn't kill him. He didn't bump his head. They hit him. They? Hello and welcome back. I hope you're enjoying The House on Haunted Hill here on Nightmare Theater. Boy, I know I am, but I have a question though. How did Castle get the great Vincent Price? 
to be in this film. Well, Price had been turned down for another movie and Castle happened to run into him in a coffee shop. When Price told Castle about losing the part, Castle said, fate has brought us together and he described an idea for a movie. Castle was a great talker and a great showman. He could talk people into anything. I bet he could talk El Sapo here into taking a bath once in a while. Over pie and coffee, he described the concept to Price and Price agreed to a two picture deal right there in the coffee shop. This one and the tingler. How do you know so much about this? Well, I was there. I was working in the coffee shop. I made the pie. Really? That is amazing. Okay, I wasn't, I wasn't there at all. I, I made all that up. I read about it in Castle's autobiography. For more about William Castle, visit your local library. This is a great film so far. It's got a great cast. Well, in addition to Price, it stars Richard Long from The Big Valley and the great character actor Elisha Cook, who was in such great films as The Maltese Falcon, The Big Sleep, and Roseberry's Baby. Uh, definitely a great cast. So let's get back to The House on Haunted Hill here on Nightmare Theater. Nora, when you came in, you said something about a ghost. There was something. What did it look like? Well, it, it was wearing a black thing that went all the way to the floor. Weren't you a little frightened at the time? Well, yes. That, Mr. Lauren, is hysteria. Well, then, Doctor, how do you explain what happened to Lance? Was that hysteria, too? You better get that checked in a day or so. Thanks, Doc. Wait for me in the hall. The ghosts are coming closer, Mr. Lauren. You really believe in your pet ghost, don't you, Pritchett? Before the night's over, you will, too. Wouldn't you like a drink, Lance? Uh, no, thanks. I'd like one. Scotch and. Mr. Lauren, are you really going to pay anyone who stays all night? Certainly. $10,000. Will there be much red tape or delay? In a hurry, dear? And frankly, yes. Or frantically. There you are, my dear. or something was in here when I came in. But where? And if the door was locked, how did it get out? What you saw might have been a ghost, Nora, but what was in here with me was no ghost. I don't know. I was so scared. Does that sound different to you? on this wall. Run it. 
just floats. Yeah, but the, why didn't I see it? You don't believe me. Well, can I? I'm Annabelle Lauren. You must be Miss Manning. I realize this is a very unusual and I'm afraid very dull party. Wouldn't you like to freshen up? This is your room. Depressing, isn't it? I doubt if I'll spend much time here. It's going to rain. Perfect atmosphere for my husband's party. Why did you come here? He said he'd give me $10,000. Why did he pick you? I don't know. My supervisor just came and said I'd been invited. How long have you known my husband? I just met him tonight. So? Why you? What were you doing wandering around by yourself? Well, I was in the cellar with Lance, Mr. Schroeder, and I just left, that's all. Don't do it again. Don't go anywhere in this house by yourself. Now fix your face and I'll come by for you in a few minutes. But I... You're in danger. We all are. But who? I hope for your sake you never find out. I'm Annabelle Lauren. Were you looking for something? Uh, not exactly. Are you the doctor? No. No, I'm Lance Schroeder. The pilot. You've hurt yourself. Oh, it's uh, just a bump on the head. Which is my room? I believe this is it. Thank you, Mrs. Lauren. Annabelle Lance. You were with the young girl in the cellar. Why was she so upset? Was she? And you don't look like the type to go around bumping his head. What really happened, Lance? Well, Nora thought she saw a ghost, but uh, I didn't see anything. She was just frightened then. And mad at me, I think. I kidded her about it. I wouldn't joke about anything else that happens here tonight. Now, don't tell me you're taking all this seriously. Aren't you? Well, I'd uh, like to find out what hit me. Lance. If I need help, may I count on you? <laughs> sure, I guess so. Look, what's going on here, anyway? I mean, what is with this party bit? This is no party. He's planning something. Your husband? I wish I knew what it was. Must be pretty big if he's going to lay out 50000 The Money doesn't mean anything. He has a reason for getting us all up here to this dreadful old house. Well, what for? He doesn't even know us. Maybe that's exactly why you're here. Well, what can he get away with? Oh, he thinks that big money like his can get away with anything. You know, of course, that I'm his fourth wife. The first simply disappeared. The other two died. Lance, I don't want to join them. You mean he, uh... Oh, his doctor said they died of heart attacks. Two girls. In their 20s. Well, what can he do? My husband is sometimes insane with jealousy. Nothing matters to him then. Please be careful. Would he hurt you? He would kill me if he could.
missing all the fun. Nora Manning was almost killed by a falling chandelier. The pilot bashed his head in. Is he badly hurt? The Saturnine psychiatrist bandaged him up. Don't you want to go and console him, as you do most men, in your fashion? You're so clever, Frederick. Yes, I lie awake nights wondering why I married you. It was rather a mistake. You didn't marry me, dear. I married you. Unpleasant, but no mistake. Well, hurry up. Frederick, for the last time, I'm not going to your party. And for the last time, it's not my party, but yours. And you are going. I am not. Are you ready, dear? No. Are you ready, dear? Yes, damn you. Would you adore me as much if I were cool? <laughs> no. All you want to be is a lovely widow. It's almost time to lock up the house. And then your party will really begin. I wonder how it'll end. down in a minute. Who is it? Your host, my dear. It's almost midnight, Nora. We're all going to get together down in the living room. All right, Mr. Lloyd. I'll be right down. Slides and his wife. They've been caretakers here for years. She's blind, you know. I'm not going to stay here. Well, Doctor, it looks like we have a real case of hysteria on our hands. I think she's just a little upset. Not hysterical. Good evening. My wife. These are our guests. Ruth Bridges, Dr. Trent. You know Watson Pritchard, of course. Nora Manning. And uh, this is Lance Schroeder. Get me out of here. Now, what about the 10,000? I don't care. He wants to kill me. Who wants to kill you? Mr. Lawrence. May I have your attention, please? I think you all remember the bargain we made about staying all night. $10,000 apiece. If any of you don't survive, $50,000 will be divided amongst the rest of you. If I should die, you will be paid by my estate. When the door is locked from the outside by the caretakers, we'll all be forced to stay in this house until morning. 
If any of you decide not to stay, you must leave with the caretakers now. You won't have a chance to change your minds later, because there'll be no way to get out. I don't want to stay. Wait. <laughs> Yet, who told them they could leave? They never leave before midnight. Well, they've gone now. I was going to ask you whether you wanted to stay or not, but it seems that the caretakers have made the decision for you. We're all locked in now. But I don't want to stay. And I'm sorry, my dear, but it's too late now. Darling, haven't you had enough of the silly game? Get some cars up here for these people and let them go home. But pay them first. This is your party, remember? In spite of my wife's faith in my ability to do the impossible, we will all have to stay in this house until 8 o'clock in the morning. But we have some party favors for you in these little coffins. This is my wife's idea. I must say, I think it's rather dangerous. I suppose you all know how to use one of these things, but in case you don't, you just press down on this lever with your thumb and then pull the trigger. You see, they're loaded. These are no good against the dead, only the living. Doctor? Lance? Nora. Go ahead, take it. Miss Bridges. And here's yours, dear. I don't need it. It was your idea. Who knows, you may want to use it on me before this night is over. Throw these guns away. They won't do you any good. I agree with Pritchard on that point, although not for the same reason. Dr. Trent, don't you approve of our little party favors? Suppose Nora had had a gun when she mistook the blind woman for a ghost. I don't think anyone else is going to walk around in total darkness. <laughs> oh, I'm sure we're not going to go running around the house shooting each other, aren't you? Who knows? Fear makes people do amazing things. You said your sister-in-law killed a man and a woman here and cut them up? You said they found hands and feet, but they never found any heads. Would you like to see one of those heads? Would you all like to see one of those heads? Well, then, just follow me. Darling, I really don't need this. What I'm saying is, I know that the meatloaf no, no, is being turned into Salisbury no, no, steak. Not, no, no, yes, it is. Yes, you're not going to fool anybody. Far. You're not fooling anybody. Oh, uh, welcome back, everyone. We're back here again in the what is it? The sub, 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 sub basement here at the TV studio, and uh, we're back with the amazing curator who looks over the Merrill Movie Museum, which is a huge collection of props from your favorite television shows and movies, and he's brought us another item, and this one looks really impressive. So what do we have tonight? So this is a Superman costume, if that wasn't completely obvious. This particular costume was worn by Dean Cain during the production of the 1990s television series, Lois and Clark, The New Adventures of Superman. So this is one of many suits they made for, for Dean to wear, and 
This is really kind of old school superhero construction because this is a spandex suit. It, it really is when it's not on a mannequin, it's about this big. No way. So, and it actually looks purple when it's not on a mannequin, but once it's stretched into the shape that it would be for a Human. buff guy like Human. Dean Cain, it takes on the familiar colors of Superman. So you're saying that Dean Cain didn't eat a lot of uh, fast food when he was doing this show? No, pretty low carb, high protein. I think it's gonna fit, boss. I think if we, if we, if we, if we can I'm make not, it work. I'm not wearing the suit. Now, now listen, Superman himself has a long history on television and in movies and, and that stuff, going all the way back to the serials and then of course the, the great, yeah, Kirk Allen in the original and then George Reeves and all of these people who were in these Superman films. So uh, can you talk a little bit about Superman as a, as a cultural icon? Well, he is pretty much the original superhero. There, there are a couple of characters that you might make that claim about, but Superman is the reason that we have superheroes, period. He was created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, who wanted to sell it as a newspaper strip. Nobody would buy it. Uh, finally, DC Comics needed something to fill the first issue of a comic they were launching called Action Comics. And somebody dug it up out of the piles of submissions they had said, nobody's ever gonna believe this, but we need something, so let's throw it out there and give it a shot. That's exactly how I got this job. And it became the icon. And, and he's gone, he's grown over the years, he's, but he's always been around, you know, truth, justice, and the American way. Like I said, we talked about Kirk Allen was the first guy to put on the Superman costume, sure. and that was right after Superman was essentially introduced. Then in the 1950s, we had the television series. Of course, a lot of people, I think, are familiar with the 1970s movies that starred Christopher Reeve. Uh, and, and Gene Hackman as Lex Luthor, his arch nemesis, going into the Brandon Ruth films. Uh, and, just, and it continues today. Even today, we still have Henry Cavill playing Hen Superman. Henry Cavill playing him on in the films, and Tyler Hoechlin playing him on Supergirl on the CW. Right. And uh, Dean Cain actually has returned to that universe, playing uh, Jeremiah Danvers, Kara Danvers' adopted father on Supergirl. Right, and we can't forget Smallville which was right. another series that was based on, although we didn't really see the costume the very until last the very scene. end yeah, of, of that show that we didn't see the iconic costume of Superman. But Superman is one of those characters who go, cuts across all media. This is really an iconic piece from television fit. and movies. It is going it's, to I'm, fit. I'm not wearing it. It doesn't matter, I'm not wearing it. I, I'm gonna have to do a lot of sit-ups before I can get into this. Anyway, thanks again for bringing us this unbelievable piece, and why don't you folks get back to the movie here on Nightmare Theater. Just go look in my suitcase. Just go look. But it was in there. A woman's head. Nora, I think you're a little upset. Would you care for a sedative? Get out! Get out, all of you! All of you, get out of here and leave me alone! You think it's all right to leave her by herself, Doctor? I wish she'd taken the sedative. Well, what do you suppose she thought she saw? They're closing in on her. Look, Doc, I think somebody ought to stay with her. There could be a million people around her. And if they wanted her, they'd get her. What if he's right? Oh, he's too drunk to know what he's talking about. I wonder. I'll join you in a minute. Do you think it would do any good if you went in and talked to her? Well, do you think there really was a head in her suitcase? I don't know. A thing like that would put me right over the edge. Look, would you sort of stay up here, I mean, in case she needs help? All right. I'll be in my room. Just call it. Thanks. Are you sure there are only seven people in this house? Positive, except for the ghosts. I don't believe in ghosts, nor in frightening women. In Nora's case, it's gone far enough, perhaps too far. What do you suggest we do about it, Doctor? Don't frighten her anymore. <laughs> Nora. 
Nora? Nora? about this. They've taken her. In a little while, she'll be one of them. Where's Nor... Where is she? It's too late. It's too late. You'll never find her again. Pritchard, if you know where she is, you better tell me now. She's gone. She's gone with them. And there's nothing you can do about it. She's dead, Mr. Lauren. Your wife hanged herself. Suicide. About this? I don't know. It was, it was dark, but it must have been him. Has anybody seen you since he left you? I heard some people in that room, but I went by and nobody saw me. Mrs. Lauren is dead. But how? Lauren said she committed suicide, but I think somebody killed her. Him? I'm sure you've come to the same conclusion I have. Yeah, I think so. Well, let's all have a meeting, discuss what to do. The living room? Okay, in a minute. I gotta go downstairs. 
Now, you lock yourself in here and don't let anybody know you're here. If he thinks you're dead, he won't come here. And I'll get back as soon as I can. You'll be all right. And if you have to, you use it. You're drunk. All right, out with it, Bridget. Why did you come into this room? I'm the only one who understands. Understands what? Uh, your wife isn't there anymore. She's already joined them. Look, Bridget, I've had enough of your spook talk. Get out, you sot, and don't come back into this room again. What's her name? Nora. I didn't disturb her since I don't think this concerns her. No, you're right. Mr. Lauren, isn't there some way we can get out of this house now? No, none at all. We could try breaking out. The only door to the outside is made of steel. The bars of the windows are set in solid stone. We've got to stay. I'm not afraid of your ghosts, Bridget. But I am afraid. When we came here a few hours ago, the only thing we had in common was the $10,000 we'd get. Now, however, we share something else. The death of Mrs. Lauren. So far tonight, one of us was almost killed by a falling chandelier. One of us was mysteriously slugged. One of us has been driven to the brink of absolute hysteria. And one of us is dead. Were these accidents? Suicide? And we must stay here for six more hours. Six hours? Six of us. Time enough. Who will be next? How will it happen? Let me ask you a question, Doctor. You were the first one to see my wife there. Did you also see anything that she could have climbed up on and then jumped? No. Did any of them? There was nothing. How then did she get up there so high? Exactly, Mr. Lauren, how? She couldn't have pulled herself up there. She couldn't have dropped from the ceiling. Do you think your wife killed herself? No. She was murdered by one of you. Or you, Mr. Lauren. To deliberately kill someone, you must have a reason. We were all strangers to your wife. Only you had a motive for murder. What husband hasn't at some time wanted to kill his wife? What husband hasn't had a thousand opportunities to do it in such a way so that he'd never be suspected? I'm not such a fool as to hang my wife from a ceiling by a rope. The fact remains that you, or one of us, murdered Mrs. Lauren. And that's a matter for the police. 
So how do we get the police? That's my point. We can't until morning. What began as a silly party given by an eccentric has now involved us all in murder. For once, Pritchard may be right. If another murder's in the works, let's stop it now. Another murder? Why not? Maybe one of us saw too much. Why should even a millionaire want to give each of us $10,000 to spend one night in a gloomy old house? To see some ghosts, have a party? No. Have you finished trying me, doctor? And is the verdict guilty of murder? Oh, this isn't getting us anywhere. Somebody killed Mrs. Lauren, we know that. One of us is guilty and the rest of us are innocent, okay. Now what we have to do for the next six hours is protect ourselves from each other. Do you really think... I don't think anything. I just know that I'm going to my room. And if anybody comes in, I'll shoot him. Or her. And if we all stay in our rooms, we'll be safe. Because the innocent will have no reason to leave his room. And the guilty will admit his guilt if he or she does. And we all have guns. And we're all agreed. Oh, I wish this night were over. Rooms? Guns? I tell you, it doesn't make any difference. They aren't through with us yet. Hello and welcome back. I hope you're enjoying the house on Haunted Hill. You know, I was thinking... Say, boss, I checked the mail earlier and something came for you in mittens today. Something came for us. Can't you see I'm right in the middle of something, El Sapo? But it's marked urgent and official, so maybe you ought to open it right now. It could be a check, or maybe you won the lottery. All right, well, let me see here. Well, mittens, it seems that someone has invited us to a party. Here, listen to this. Colonel El Sapo de Tempesto cordially invites you to a party at his palatial estate. If you survive the party, you will be given a prize. Oh, Colonel, eh? Yeah, well, yeah, well I, I was a colonel, sorta. But if you agree to come to my party and you make it to the end, you'll get a special prize if you survive. Let me guess, Sapo. This is some sort of thing where you're going to try to scare us with cheap props and cheap sight gags, maybe some sort of head on a string or a loud bang or something? No, no. I was going to recruit the two of you as salesmen. I have started a line of plastic wear called El Sapo Wear. See, each bowl seals itself and has my face right on the lid. Food will never spoil with my smiling face there to protect it. I was going to give the one of you who sold the most Sapo wear a special prize. This durable ice cream scoop. Now it's a $15 value, but it could be yours or yours mittens if you sell the most Sapo wear. So how about it, gentlemen? Fate is calling. Are either of you in? No, we are not in, but I am about to stuff you in that bowl. Let's get back to the house on Haunted Hill here on Nightmare Theater. What's the use of saying good night? Good night.
Okay. They've all gone to their rooms and locked themselves in. Lance, I've been thinking. It was so dark down there. Maybe it wasn't Mr. Lord. It was him, all right. He tried to kill you, and he did kill his wife. How can you be so sure? She tried to warn me, ask me to help her. The doc thinks he's going to try and kill one of us. Now, there must be a way out of this place, and I'm going to find it and get the police before he does. I'm going with you. What if he finds out you're alive? No, Nora. You're safer here than any place else. Now, just lock yourself in and keep quiet. If I find a way out, I'll come back and get you.
an admission of guilt, Doctor? Certainly not. There's either somebody else in this house or one of us has left his room. Did you hear anything? Organ music? That. And someone walking. You got yours? Ready? You look downstairs, and I'll look up here. Why not together? There may be only minutes, seconds left of someone's life. Why waste time? over, darling. Every detail was perfect. What's happening? We've done it. A perfect crime. Beautiful. Has she killed him? Not yet. But she will. Get me out of this hanging harness. What's taking that girl so long? What time is it? At first, I couldn't get Nora to want to protect herself with a gun. But after you appeared at the window, everything began to work just as we had planned. You were wonderful. Just the touch that finally drove her into complete hysteria. It'll be worth all of our planning, darling. Where's Nora now? What's happening? On her way to the cellar. So scared, she'll shoot the first thing that moves. And Frederick? On his way to the cellar, too. David, are you sure none of them will suspect us? Of what? An hysterical girl accidentally shoots somebody? Who would suspect that we planned it that way, that we drove her to it? What about my suicide? We're just a ghost party gag. We'll claim it was a dummy, since I'm the only one who touched you. And the caretakers? Well, they had no idea what they were really doing. What about Nora? She's not stupid, you know. Darling, believe me, everything we've planned is working perfectly. Nora is sure Frederick murdered you. She thinks Frederick attacked her in the cellar, not me. And now Nora's almost out of her mind with fear. The heads, the music, you're hanging. I tell you, when Frederick walks in there, she'll shoot him. It's taking too long. David, you ought to be there. When you hear the shot, come down to the cellar.
David? David? or not. It's a pity you didn't know when you started your game of murder that I was playing too. There must be some way to get in here. Well, it's right along here somewhere. Lance! I've shot Mr. Lorne. He's down in the wine cellar. Alive? I don't think so. He's alive. You didn't shoot anyone, my dear. I loaded your gun with blanks. I can tell you all now. Trent and my wife were planning to kill me. They failed. Trent tried to throw me in the vat. My wife stumbled and fell. I'm ready for justice to decide if I'm... Innocent or guilty. Now there are nine. 
There'll be more, many more. They're coming for me now. And then they'll come for you. Welcome back. Well, that was quite a shock ending, wasn't it? Sapo, you were asking me about the gimmicks that were used for this film. Uh, when the skeleton came out of the acid, Castle had skeletons rigged up in the theater. The skeletons would seem to walk across the screen and they would come down across a line over the audience. That trick was called Emergo. It was great the first few times, but then the kids, they, they started throwing things at the skeletons. The gimmick was saved until the end of the film. You know, I thought the beginning of the film was pretty scary too. The complete black screen and all the loud, scary noises, great gimmick. Yeah, it was, and Castle was the first one to do it. This film was pretty successful. Um, Alfred Hitchcock saw the press on this film and decided a horror film could be made for very little money, and if done well, it could make a lot of money. So he made Psycho in 1960. Castle made a film soon after called Homicidal, which was similar in many ways. For this film, Castle offered a fright break, where the film was paused and the audience was offered a chance to leave if they were too scared to see the ending. Hey, speaking of leaving, isn't it about time for us to go? It is, but why don't you show them what we have on tap for them next week, El Sapo? I am way ahead of you for once, boss. Feast your eyes on this. Feed me. Oh, take it easy, Dracula. What do you think I'm carrying here, my dirty laundry? where a man-eating, talking plant gives homicide something to think about. And I didn't do it. Do what? Whatever. Ever see this man? Man, see picture. Why are you so nervous? Oh, boy, you kiss good, Audrey. Well, I guess I just have a good kiss, sir. Now you will do as I say. Yes, master. You will go out and find me some food. Yes, master. What's the matter? Don't you like me? Too bony. Too bony? Nobody ever told me that before. Beef is better than veal. Ah, you're such a dodo. What do you call this? Chopped liver? <laughs> Oh man, I sense the specter of Corman. That's not good. But we hope you will turn in anyway. In the meantime... So, so I guess it's still a no on being a sapperware salesman? If you sell 35 cases, you are entered into a drawing to have dinner with me. It's a no, Sappo. In the meantime, may all your dreams be nightmares.